Hello everyone. Welcome to another one of our Facebook Lives. Hope all of you had a nice three-day weekend, a little Memorial Day uh, celebration. Um, it's nice to be back on a Tuesday. Feels like a Monday, but it's Tuesday, so welcome. Well, let's see. Today is not only a Facebook Live day, but it is also the day of launching our June project for So Confident Series 10. And we're really excited about this. The project is the hibiscus shirt. Now, for some of you who've been around for a while, you know that the hibiscus shirt was a pattern of ours some years ago. And then it was discontinued, but we took a look at it and thought, you know, this is still really current and very uh, fits into what's happening in uh, fashion today. So we have reprinted the hibiscus shirt and it is the So Confident project for the month. So we have two kit options, one in a blue, it's a blue and white little tiny check, and we have picked out some coordinating stripes and of different scales for the bottom panels. Here's a wider stripe. The sleeve has this wonderful insertion kind of a bell sleeve with a different scale of stripe. The pocket is this nice little mini floral. Contrasting buttons, and we even have one button that's very different, very unique, and it's a floral, and the rest of them are solid. And then we have a contrasting little check stand and under collar. So that's kit I'm probably going to say this wrong. It's one of the kits. I'm not sure if it's A or B. I think it might be A. And the other colorway is a white with a gray stripe, a wider stripe and darker on the bottom with a Liberty of London fabric for the pocket. Similar buttons, same floral button. And then the under collar here is a red and white little mini check. It reads as pink but it is a red and white. So these are the two kit options. We're gearing up to cut kits and send kits out this week, so hopefully you have had a chance to look at your prep letter. There are some things to watch in that prep letter. For instance, since the printing, I've decided that this looks better two inches longer. So part of your prep letter includes a drawing of how to lengthen this pattern, the fronts and the backs, the back and fronts, and because it is asymmetric, and so there's a little bit of thinking about how you do that. And what you cut out of what fabric and how you get ready for this. Make a little template for your stand. We've talked about templates for the stand in previous Facebook Live sessions. So that's included in your prep letter. So there's, there are a few attachments in that prep letter that you want to um, look at. So we're really excited about this. Hopefully you'll like the hibiscus shirt as well. We're doing a little bit of skill building on shirt making. Last month the whistle shirt was a simple rectangu rectangular collar and the sleeve was set in flat. This month we've moved into a shirt that has a collar and a stand and a set-in sleeve and quite a few other little details too. So looking forward to working with you on that. The video launches on June 18th on a Friday, a couple weeks from now. All right. Well, you all know that I, um, I read the Wall Street Journal faithfully on Saturdays in the off-duty section. And I just thought it was interesting that there's a, an article about uh, don't worry, dress happy. And it's really all about how we've come out of the pandemic or are coming out of the pandemic. Uh, for the last year or so, we've been wearing sweats and more neutral colors. And now, according to Jeremy Scott, the creative director for Machino, He's seeing the Roaring Twenties style decadence coming upon us, and he's calling it joy dressing. But it's, the phenomenon started brewing back in February, where we're just seeing more color and florals and ruffles, and what else? Um, let's see. In pandemic's darkest days, customers were buying a sea of very neutral tones and loungewear. Now we're seeing spirited prints, swishy tiered skirts, jubilant ruffles, as well as very bright, bold, colorful dresses. 
Which leads me into Deb, who's going to walk on here now. And last week, you arrived on a Friday or Thursday or whatever it was, wearing this dress with the ruffles and the tears, just like the Wall Street Journal. You are so trendy. Did you know that? No. But you are. <laughs> I think you do know that, actually, because yeah. you follow... I do uh, you do follow the styles and the trends. And I so, like to copy. And she loves to copy, <laughs> and you are one of the best pattern hackers I've ever run into. Oh, I am not a pattern hacker, like, and you are really something at this. So you have to tell the story about how this dress evolved. But it was because of this dress, really, that we're talking about the topic we're talking about today. So okay. you went to the mall. I went to the mall three months ago and they were having a bunch of stuff on clearance and I found this really cute dress it was on sale for like $17. $17 for a dress. Not they bad. had these big puffy sleeves and a little rough on the back, buttons on the back. So I bought it. And then I was like, well, I want to make this. I can't find a pattern anywhere that matched that dress. So then Samantha was here two weeks ago and she's pattern hacking these dresses. And I'm like, I can do that. Yeah. So I got to find a pattern that has a straight line and set in sleeves. And then somebody bought the Berwick pattern, and I went, oh, there it is. I have this at home. I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> All right, so, so let's look at the Berwick. And by the way, according to my friend Margaret, it should be Berwick. Oh, I'm sorry. But we Kansans call it Berwick Street Tunic. <laughs> so I have it on. Here it is. So it has a, um, a seam below the waist with some details of some little pleats, five or six pleats has a front placket with hidden buttons, has a little stand, has a very long sleeve. And by the way, if you're ever making the Berwick, you want to check the sleeve length because we find it to be really too long on many, many people. And it has this sort of bottom skirt. So how you looked at this and got to this is really interesting. So you were inspired by a dress yep. and you were looking for a bodice that was straight, straight and, a and a set in sleeves. That's, those were the two ingredients of what you were looking for. Yep. All right, so tell us where you went from there. So I had to do the neckline three different times to get it to come out right. And the placket on the front is now on the back. Oh, there are buttons down the back. Well, isn't that the cutest thing? They are all functional, but I only undo the top three to get it on and off. All right. But for some reason in my head, if the bottom ones were fake, it wouldn't look right. Maybe that's an OCD thing. I don't know. But so no, they're all no. functional. Yeah. I think that's just fine. So, but so, how, do you how did you come up with the neckline shape? Um, well, first I traced the dress that I bought. And it just didn't work because it was a slinky kind of fabric and it moved around a lot. So I threw it on my mannequin and took it off, recut it, threw it back up on my mannequin. And so I went ahead and stitched the pattern pieces together because it's a tracing cloth that Pellon has. And it has grids on it. It has grids on it. Yeah. But it's a cloth, so I'm able to baste it together and then stick it back on my mannequin. And nope, that still didn't work. So third time's a charm, and this is where it came out. Of. That's interesting. A lot of people ask me if I use a dress form or a mannequin, and I don't much. Uh, I for sure really don't use them for fitting, for real fitting, but this is why you want one, perhaps, yeah. is for design details and being able to put something on you and really check that the shape of something, the proportions of something. I think that's when a dress form or a mannequin comes in handy. Yeah. Okay, so you got your neckline established, you got the placket down the back, you, down the back. you put the front on the fold, so you, yep. you eliminated the front placket, yep. and then where'd you go from there? Oh, before we go any further, okay. the front fold is actually the button line. But the pattern piece does say that. If you look at it, it says right in between the buttons, center front. Yeah, that's oh. a tricky thing, though, yeah. uh, because this particular placket, of course, has several folds and several lines to it beyond the center front. So if a pattern does not say center front, because I'm not sure every one of our patterns where the buttons are says center front, but you always know that button, the button placement is the center front of a pattern. That is standard. Okay. okay, I keep interrupting you, oh, but you know. <laughs> so anyway, the length of it is, it's, I think it's about eight inches longer than what the pattern actually was. So I wanted to hit my hips. And then this is 12 inch ruffle, 
twice the width, so about 84 inches around on the bottom. So you doubled the width, just like you would a drapery. <laughs> yeah, a curtain. <laughs> it's a curtain on the bottom. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. never mind. Yeah. All right. So then the sleeves was a whole other ball game. Um, so what I did was I measured the sleeve width and the sleeve length on the dress that I bought. And then I cut out a rectangle of my pattern tracing cloth. And so I took the front part of the sleeve and traced it out on one side, slid it over, and then traced the back out on the other side. So that way I still had the same arm, arm's eye opening to match the dress, but I was able to gather lots of gathers. So I gathered the top to set in sleeve and I gathered the bottom. And it's just got a little, just a little band that covers up everything. There's no elastic. So. Oh, I think this is really an interesting uh, way to do a sleeve. I don't know that I would have thought this. So you have the original sleeve up to a certain point. Wherever this got slid from side to side, there's this much distance. But the sleeve is actually inset one-to-one -one ratio up to a certain point yeah. and then gathered across the top, but the top is pretty wide yeah. and lots of gathers. Because the gathers really start right here. Yes. So, so the gathers are, yeah. yeah. So the, the gathers don't go all the way around. Right. I think that's an important point to, yeah. to uh, point out. And the gathers on the bottom go almost all the way around, but up here it was, it was a couple inches past where the notches are. So right. just the fullness is on the top. And so when you gather this, do you have any special gathering tips for us? How, do you use a zigzag? Do you do two or three rows of basting? Do I, you? I do a, a zigzag, the longest width or the widest width and the longest stitch. Yeah. Um, do you do it over a cord or not? No. No, you do. I just I pull on the bottom thread. Okay. So. All right. Well, those are nice even gathers. I mean, I'm 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 always a little, I don't know. Gathers are one of those things that make me pause. There are certain things about sewing that make me pause, and gathers are one of them. So now this is, is this faced then? You've created a facing? Faced. I did make the facing. All right. So. All right. So about an inch or inch and a half, inch and a quarter facing, something like that. Well, I think this is brilliant. Now she's used two Liberty of London fabrics. That we don't one have of which, do we not have either one of we them? We don't have either one of them. So can't right. go there. But it's, <laughs> um, Liberty of London is a really nice cotton. Uh, we've talked about Liberty of London fabrics quite a bit, but it's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, nice cotton. So all woven, no knit involved here. Nope. And I, these cottons uh, just look great all the time. You know, cotton does wrinkle, but there's something about Liberty of London cottons that don't wrinkle a lot. Not as much. Not as much. And they wrinkle nicely, <laughs> if there is such a thing. All right, well, you can stay up here and we'll, we'll talk about other things. But I think this is... Um, this was the launching point for talking about the Berwick Street tunic, which I happen to like a lot. And you know, we just don't talk about all of our patterns routinely over and over again. And this is one we haven't talked about for a long time. So let's get this little guy in here. <clears throat> so this is, a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, another way to think about the Berwick Street tunic, where you can do some color blocking. And this is in a viscous rayon with a pale blush and a white. But my daughter, Alex, uh, spent a couple of years in London getting her master's degree, and she designed this wonderful little design of the five iconic architectural buildings in London. So I think this is really sweet. And this particular design has been hand sewn with primarily a back stitch and then some, some little French knots. So we actually have this design uh, digitized. My friend Karna from Bueller, Kansas, which is near Hutchinson, Kansas, is the best digitizer on the planet, I think. And she digitized Alex's design, and she turned it into both a machine-stitched design or we have the hand-stitched design, both of which are on the website and both of which are free this week. How about that? So uh, take a look at uh, the design. So here are the, the color blocking. Here's the color blocking, a, a white sleeve with a white left side and a pink right sleeve and pink right side and skirt. So let's look at some other variations. All right, here's another. You hold this. 
Um, so here it is more contrasted with black and white. Uh, obviously the white side, black side, and then the London design hand stitched in black with a little bit of accent of red. And then of course bringing up that red button just as the single button at the top is a really fun thing to do. So those are sort of normal, <laughs> if, if there is such a thing, uh, Berwick Street tunics. Now the one I have on, I like a lot because it's very, very comfortable. This is linen, sort of a lightweight, well, medium weight linen. But the back and the sleeves are viscose jersey knit. And because of that, I'm, I'm very comfortable. Because this is, this shirt, you know, it fits at the shoulders through the bust. You know, it's not a generous roomy garment. Uh, it can be a little bit more roomy in the hips, obviously, but through the upper portion of the garment, it's fairly fitted. So with this knit, I'm just, I'm just, I can play tennis. Not really. <laughs> All right, so then here are a couple of other variations. This one I, I just love. This was inspired by a person, uh, Jan Black's granddaughter, actually, who was at Chateau de Ma a couple of years ago, and she made a little variation of the Berwick Street, very much like this. So this is a striped fabric that has horizontal stripes on the top and then vertical stripe with an added pocket. Now the buttons are exposed, not inside of a placket, and all the pleats are removed from the bottom skirt. So there's not too much different about this. This has just been kind of edited and some of the details taken away. So the band is gone. This, all of the um, vent and little cuff is gone on the sleeve, and now this is a roll-up cuff, which I think is a great detail, but same width, nothing's been done, not nearly like what you did to hack it, and then simply folding out the pleats on the bottom skirt, and they're gone, because a lot of people object to this if you're kind of full in the stomach, you don't need any more <clears throat> volume there, then maybe this is the answer. One thing about the neck that I, I like and use sometimes is if I don't want to make a facing, let's march this forward a little bit, then I like to use that packaged bias binding as my binding and I find that it's just it makes a neckline just so easy to put in and I don't have to deal with how to cut a facing and what width am I going to use and if I'm going to top stitch it or whatever. So a nice simple summer shirt in a cotton stripe but again it's a Berwick. Another one that's very interesting, this is a little bit on the order of what you did in the sense that it has a, a facing for the neckline. This seam though, where the buttons would have been now is a contrast, it's a, it's a visible seam with contrasting colors. And the pleats have just been reorganized and deepened. So there are four pleats across here a little bit deeper than the normal pleat on the Berwick. And the back is solid and a shorter sleeve, simply been cut off. Now this is a, a lightweight viscose linen in a navy blue and a royal blue. So easy to wear. I might have to wear this. This is so darn cute. I, I see these garments, I pull these off the rack uh, that we have here at the sewing workshop and I think, oh my gosh, I need to be wearing that. I forget all the clothes that we have. This one is lightweight denim. This does have the concealed placket, but now if for some of you who know the Stafford jacket pattern that has, it's like a, um, a denim jacket, we call it, that has the Western style insertions here and the flap. So that detail has been borrowed from the Stafford and inserted here. So there's a seam here, the flap, and the insertion. And then this skirt has wider pleats, but now this is an overlay. So this is fringed. This is the denim that's been washed and fringed, much like we did on the Charlie Bomber jacket. And now this has been overlaid, and, and the fringe is an accent. And then the bottom is not hemmed, but again, the fringe is part of its element. So, yeah, uh, a yoke added to make it, uh, you know, a little bit more like 
the front, and all the edges have been top stitched. So there's quite a nice detail on this, but the fact that it's a lightweight denim turns it into a shirt and a jacket. All right, so let's, this one, by the way, is rayon chalet. And we have, as you know from last week, a lot of rayon chalets. All right, let's look at some fabrics. Well, let's start with our denim, since we just talked about that. Push this guy out of the way a little bit. All right, so we have, you know, you can look at something denim, and, you know, you don't always know. This is like the perfect denim. You got it? You yep. got it? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to let it go. <laughs> um, not all denims are drapey. But this one is nice and drapey and would make a fabulous Berwick shirt or jacket. And I like the way, you know, you can always tell a denim because it has the blue for one, uh, the um, lengthwise and the white is the crosswise weave. So you always have two colors. That's when you can tell it's a denim. That actually has a nice little selvage that could be used at the bottom of the sleeve or the bottom of the garment or overlaid instead of fringe or whatever. All kinds of possibilities there. If you're interested in the, the two, the two uh, color one, we have a navy blue. Viscose linen. And you know, when we use our viscose linens, it has the properties of linen and it has the properties of rayon. So you have the drape, the soft drape of rayon, and you have a little bit of visual character of linen, but it doesn't uh, wrinkle nearly like the linens do. So here are a couple of colors that could be color blocked and worked together. Then I love this stripe, and I think th this stripe could be uh, combined with anything. This is a uh, woven stripe and it has a denim feel to it. It's not true denim but it certainly is denim colored and it has about a quarter inch wide pinstripe. I actually really like it with this white and this is the viscous linen as well. And here is a, a sort of natural, what's that color called? Does it say on there? What do we call it? Limestone. Limestone. That's really a good name for it. You know, you, there's so many wonderful neutral combinations now of putting white with a, a beige or an off-white or a limestone. So you could do a color-blocked version there. Or, of course, you could just do the shirt in the limestone and make yourself some great white summer pants, some Hudson pants or West End pants or whatever. Here's another stripe, also drapey. Is that, what, uh, what's the fiber on that? Is this rayon? This one is tinsel. Tinsel. You know, we don't carry many tinsels. I'm, I'm very careful about buying tinsels because so many of them, do you ever have trouble with this, Deb? With, it's like um, when you sew a ten, some tinsels, it's like you're sewing, you're punching it instead of sewing it. Yep. Yeah, and so I'm, but this one is not like that. This has the characteristic of something else. <laughs> so anyway, nice and drapey, but you know, tensile doesn't wrinkle much. That's one of the nice things because it's woven so closely together. So tensile is a good travel fabric. So here's the whole denim array, neutral array. And now we're going to go to our joy of dressing colors over here where we have some combinations of the linen and the knit. So if you're interested in something like what I have on, the linen in the front, and the knit and sleeves in the back, then look at these combinations. So there's, you have the knit and I have the linen. Love that combination. Same hue, different value, different shade. And all of our linens are, I shouldn't say all of them, this, a lot of them are laundered. But if you launder them again, they get even softer. And the softer they are, then the less, you know, the wrinkles kind of change. They're not as creased. There's more of a rumple of a linen, which I like very much. So what is this one? Is this one cotton? This one's cotton. Yeah, cotton knit and 100% linen. Oh, I didn't even start with the first one here. Missed that. Purple. Yeah. So we have more tonal here. This is viscose, I think. Yep. And here's linen in beautiful eggplant purple. So not so much contrast there. 
here we have, what do you call this color? Um, peach and, well, what did we call it? What did Betsy call it? I don't I know. Remember. Rose, I guess that's, yeah, desert rose. There you go. Desert rose and light rose. Yeah. This is more peach, actually. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great combination as well. Really soft peach. That's pretty. Yeah. So summery and fresh. As soon as the rain stops here, I don't know. It's been raining for two weeks. I, we're, uh, we're flooding away, but it will stop, and then we'll wish we had some rain in August. Yep. Yeah. All right, so this one is a beautiful sea green with sort of an aqua color. I just love the play on, you know, there, there's a relationship, but they're not matching. I like that. But this has a little bit of sheen to it. This is a beautiful knit, cotton knit, this one is. And again, linen. And Erin's favorite color, teal green, Mediterranean green, beautiful combination as well. So these are the knit and linen combos like what I have on. So Erin, you have to model what you have on. Okay. As I adjust, do you want to tell them um, how, what the yardage is that they need? We've had a couple questions. Yes, on. and we had figured that out last week, but that was like a month ago. Um, <laughs> all right, so. Mic, so I can tell you, um, you can repeat it. It was, um, correct me if I'm wrong, two yards of knit and a yard and a yard half. half. Okay. Yes, yeah. that's right. Two yards of knit and a yard and a half of linen. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have it on in um, the uh, a rayon chalet. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this this morning, how both of us like to wear this generously styled. You know, to me, don't overfit this garment. Let it be oversized, loose, particularly in a rayon chalet, which is very drapey. And so, I, I think that looks fantastic. Erin's getting ready to travel, so she's hardly here. Her mind is elsewhere, but you could actually wear this in the car. You know, I'd be comfortable. You won't, but you could. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so we have things on sale, of course, this week. We have all of the fabrics on sale that we've just shown. We have the Berwick Street tunic pattern printed on sale. That is not a digital pattern, correct? It's digital as well. Okay, both. You have your choice. Hooray! Yay! <laughs> printed and digital, both of them on sale. And we have two um, tutorials that are part of the So Confident Series 8 series. The yes. Okay, so the first one, the first quarter, Series 8, was all about, is all about, all the details of making the Berwick. And I want to point out, I don't, you'll never be able to see this, but for the first time with this pattern, I figured out how to do a vent opening finish where a seam is actually sewn, then surged together as one, and then it splits. And so I saw in some ready-to-wear how to do this. And this is the first time we've ever done this technique, and it's wonderful. So the tutorial, the first quarter, has that technique. It has how to do the pleats evenly in the front. It has how to do the placket. It really is a step-by-step -step of how to make the Berwick Street tunic. Plus it has some details and measurements in it if you're interested in how this was pleated and how this was made. And then in the second quarter, Series 8 tutorial, we have the details of how to make these two. Oh, and also in the first one, we also talk about the embroidery design, the London skyline embroidery design. So two different tutorials, Series eight, that's series eight, first quarter and second quarter. Now this embroidery design, as I said, it is free. It, when you go to the website and order it, it'll be zero. Uh, both the machine 
digitized one and the hand sewn one for the next week. But we also have, what do we have, five of these left? No, five. Only five left uh, of the little embroidery kits that Alex designed that has, yeah, it has a hoop, it has embroidery floss from France. Of course, you get the embroidery design with it. You get a chocopelle. This is how you transfer the design onto your fabric. My favorite Japanese embroidery needles. The only needle threader that anybody should ever use is in here, plus the hoop. So this whole little guy, the five that we have remaining, are on sale this week. So, all right, do we have any questions? I know there was a question about whether what I'm wearing um, with it, and I'm just leggings. Uh, uh, yeah, Erin just has on leggings today. With her, She has on her travel leggings, because she's out of here <laughs> at about 12.01 uh, under her Berwick. Yes, and I guess you're wearing... I'm leggings. wearing white jeans. Um, so we told them about this, the two yards and the one and a half for the combination. Yeah, the yardage again is two yards of knit and one yard of linen. One and a half. One and a half yards of linen, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, on the denim hem, what keeps it from raveling? Well, one of the things you can do is sew a straight line of stitches and then fringe up to that. Or you can do a tiny, tiny little zigzag and fringe up to it, just to form a little bit of a barrier. I want to see me again with the camera back here. All right. All right, so here's Erin, one, one look at Erin again in her loose-fitting rayon chalet Berwick Street tunic. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. You have it on in rayon. I have it on in linen and knit. You have it on in cotton. Three totally different looks for the same pattern. I mean, that's what we like to do here at the sewing workshop is we really like to, you like to pattern hack. I like to do different fabrications. That's more my thing actually is how to take the same pattern and make it in different kinds of fabrics and maybe change a sleeve length like this sleeve length you know is three quarters I might do that but uh, in terms of super big pattern hacks but I love your idea of you know it, you don't have to go to the mall and buy a $17 dress necessarily yeah. we all th <laughs> have things in our closet that we probably like that you can trace and copy and look at and uh, think about restyling but you didn't start from zero. That's, that's really the point. You had something to work from. Yep. Could you lengthen into a dress by just extending the bottom of the Berwick? I believe you could extend this into a dress by just extend, uh, extending the bottom of the Berwick, with or without the pleats. Yes. I think it'd make a great dress. And you can also eliminate this seam and have a full front dress as well. So it can be with the seam and pleats or without the seam and pleats. Does the black and white um, color blocks, um, does it have a hidden button placket? I can only see the top button. Yes, it has the hidden button placket. The, the buttons happen to be black in this case, but the placket and buttons are there. Yeah. And Judy says that she um, has, has made some Berwicks and she wears them with the pencil pants. That's yes, good. the Berwick looks great with the pencil pants. I think this, this is a garment that does look better with slimmer pants. So the getaway jeans, helix pants, pencil pants, Hudson pants. Uh, those would be probably our choice, and our Madrid pants as well. All of those would be good pants selections for the Berwick. So we did, um, the ones where you could, if you buttoned it, unbuttoned it all the way down as a jacket, we did wear it with knit Picassos. Well, that's right. That's that right. Uh, yeah. They can't hear me. But. <laughs> yeah, we wore, Erin um, was saying that the, we styled this one open as a jacket with Picasso pants. I'd forgotten about that. I think the Picasso pants go with about anything as well. 
Would you need a full bust adjustment on the Berwick? Would you need a full bust adjustment on the Berwick? I think a lot of people would, either by uh, adding a dart or a full bust adjustment without a dart. I believe so. I think it needs to fit well through the bust since it's fitted through the bust. How did you finish the front of the black and the black and white short Berwick, the, the modified stripe with the binding, the bias? How is the bottom uh, finished? The front. How's the front? Oh, the front is just uh, turned back uh, um, about an inch and a quarter, and then turned again, so it's finished nicely on the inside. But it's a continuous piece that's folded back, and then buttonholes and buttons. Do you have a summer fabric recommendation for the Helix pants? Do I have a summer fabric recommendation for the Helix pants? Um, well, that's a good question. <laughs> for the Helix? Oh, Helix. Is that, what, was that what you said, Helix? Yeah, sorry, I was thinking Hudson. Um, well, we used to carry lightweight Ponte. We may have a color of or two. We do have a handful of... Yeah, we have a light handful of, of lightweight Pontes, and I think that would be my recommendation. You need, in my opinion, to make the Helix work well is, what you don't want is a really, really slinky knit. Mm. I think it has to have some stability to it, and it has to have spandex, so it has recovery. So lightweight Ponte, certain, there are, would be certain knits that would have some stability, or a stretch woven with a lot of stretch. We do have a couple of denims that have a lot of stretch. And when I say a lot of stretch, we say 25%, which means you would take four inches of fabric and stretch it to five inches. But honestly, I think it should even be more than that. I wonder how that cotton spandex would do. You know, that's a, we have cotton spandex in a lot of colors now. We have white, red, royal, black, navy, I think that probably has enough stretch. Now you're not going to, you might cut out a size larger or outside your normal cutting lines just as a starting point and then you could fit from then on. When you combine linen and knit, do you do anything different with the arms eye? When you, the question is, when you sew linen and knit, do you do anything uh, to the arm's eye? And the answer is no. I haven't had any trouble. Have you had any trouble combining knits and wovens in terms of sewing them together? Or Not really. I haven't either. I, I think that um, I just don't have any trouble whatsoever uh, when I combine the two fabrics. And I don't change sizes um, or anything like that. I think that stay stitching is crucial, though. I agree with that. I would definitely stay stitch the armhole and the sleeve okay. before you do anything with That way you know that they're stable before you do anything. Good idea. Um, what interfacing for the button placket? Um, the button placket does not have any interfacing in it, at least in the fabrics that we've used and the ones that we've made. But if you want to, because that by the time you, let's see, uh, you've got about one, two, three, four, four layers here. Buttonholes go through two layers, though. But if you want to use an interfacing, then you're going to want to use our Japanese Ultra Shear Fusible Interfacing. I mean, it's, it's to me, the end-all interfacing for all applications. Um, what is the sleeve of the black and white, and can we get a closer look at the top button? The sleeve of the black, this black and white one, or this one, I wonder? Probably this one. Yeah. Um, the sleeve is, uh, what was the question about the sleeve? Just a close-up of the sleeve. Okay. close-up of the, the All right. top button. Okay. Closer look at top button and what is on the sleeve of the black and white. What is on the There's sleeve? There's a red button. Oh, red button. Red button. Rather than the contrast of the white. Mm -hmm. And what is that fabric? This is viscous linen. Okay. Um, could 
Did you show the mulberry purple linen and knit again? Let's get them out of here. All right, you got that one. I've got this one. I think we talked about all the sales, the fabrics, the two tutorials, um, first edition or first quarter, second quarter of series eight. The embroidery design is free. The embroidery kit is on sale and the Berwick Street tunic printed pattern and digital pattern are on sale. Rhonda says Deb hits it out of the park every time, <laughs> which is a great thing for a Deb, you know, Deb client. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is true. It's just, I love it. You never know what she's going to wear when she comes well, in. Well, honestly, it, it took me three ball games to get this dress done. Three ball games? <laughs> Each did, ball game did they, three did they win? Two. They okay. won two my last one. <laughs> Deb is a huge baseball fan, so... Three, three games. That's not bad. Three games. That's not bad. You figure it's three, three and a half hours of ball game, so 10-ish hours to start yeah. to finish. It's not too bad. Right. Take it in chunks. Don't try to finish things <laughs> yeah. on a certain deadline. I think that's a really important thing. Not a one-day project. No. And I think, you know, we're all looking for that segment of time where we're going to make something. We never get that. So you took it a little bit at a time. So it took you, uh, was it consecutive games? Or... Um. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think there you is go. what it was. All right. But, so I listen to the ball game on the radio, so I don't have to concentrate on the TV. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Uh, next week is Kathy Davis back again with me. We're doing a really interesting um, new artistic thing that she's come up with, so you'll want to tune in for that. So we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for joining us.